So again, in our series that we began on Ash Wednesday, we're flipping around a little bit in some ways the phrase, what would Jesus do, to say, what did Jesus do? So we're going to spend hardly any time, probably zero time on trying to figure out what would Jesus do. And we want to concentrate on what he did do and apply that to our lives. So we can follow Jesus as he makes his way to the cross in the empty tomb of Easter. And so as we started this on Ash Wednesday, we talked about Jesus humbling himself to become a human being and putting aside the glories of heaven to become one of us. And we talked about giving something up. You know, there's that tradition of giving something up during these days of, of, of Lent in hopes that we would focus our eyes on Jesus more so than anything. And the question we asked is, what would you be willing to give up for someone that doesn't like you at all? And that's tough. So in giving something up, we want to have that thing enable us to reset our minds to think and focus on Jesus. And then last week we talked about waited. How we talked about we don't hear anything hardly at all about the life of Jesus from the time that the wise men leave until he's about 12 years old in the temple. We hear a little bit of something about that. And then we don't hear anything until today. When Jesus is baptized. Remember I played the chirping sound of crickets. That's kind of what the Bible tells us about that period of time. But we say that we said that also in that time of waiting, Jesus is being shaped and formed by God's grace. Our theme verse was that he grew in wisdom and in the grace of God. And so do we. Jesus was drawing deeply from God's grace, preparing for that time when the time was just right. As Galatians says, when the time had fully come, God sent forth His Son. God put in motion the events to complete and fulfill Jesus' mission of saving you and me and the entire world from sin. And we said that as we are waiting We also drink deeply, draw deeply from God's grace. As God shapes and molds us through the seasons of life, whether they are happy seasons or challenging seasons, even hurtful seasons, seasons of unknown, we still draw deeply from God's grace to us in Jesus. And so that brings us to today of Jesus' baptism. And one of the first questions that a lot of times pops into our minds is, why was Jesus baptized? I mean, he is the perfect, sinless Son of God. He doesn't need what God offers in baptism, forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation, right? Why is he baptized? And so we're going to try an illustration to understand this a little bit better today. And this illustration is going to require your participation, okay? Even though you may be a little groggy from the time change today, um, I'm going to try to involve you in this illustration. So here's what we're going to do. So stick with me, okay? As I tell the uh, kids sometimes when I lead chapel, This is the time where you need to have your uh, eyes open and your listening ears turned on and turned up, right? So here's what we need to do. Um, If you are here today as as someone who is a has a mom and a dad and at least one of your kids with you, could you stand? Okay. You're a mom and a dad and one of your kids. Please stand. Okay, this is good. This so far so good. All right. Now, here's what we're going to do. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. 
I've already identified you as having, uh, you're a family unit, right? Okay, so uh, here's what we're going to do. Now, all the dads, I have something for you to say, okay? Now, you don't have to say it individually, okay? This is all going to happen at once, okay? All right, here's what you're going to say. This is my child whom I love. I'm pleased with them, okay? This is my child whom I love. I am pleased with them. Okay, dads, let's practice. Ready? This is my child whom I love. I'm pleased with them. And you can use their name if you'd like, okay? Okay, you got that, dads? All right, here we go. Moms. Moms. Moms, after dad finishes saying that, you are going to give your best impersonation of a cheerleader. You are going to go... Here, here's some examples. You can go, woohoo, or hallelujah, yes! You can even jump up and down if you want, okay? Moms, yeah, this is the time you embarrass your kid, right? So, moms, do you think you need to practice? I don't think you probably do. I think you got it down. Okay. Kids, here's what you do, okay? Here's what you do. Okay, kids, let's all practice. Ready? Okay, there you go. All right, so you're ready. Okay, dads, so you start this off by saying, this is my child whom I love. I'm pleased with them. If you want to flip that around a little bit, however you want to, okay, you get the gist. Okay, so when I say go, all this is going to happen. Okay, so dads, you say your part. Moms, you do your cheerleader impersonation. And kids, you just... Okay? All right, here we go. On the count of three. One, two, three, go. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, you can sit down. Give yourself a hand. I got to share with you today, um, my mom and dad are here today, and so I got to do the part of the kid, you know. I feel like that. It's not very often my mom and dad get to get to worship in the same place where I'm at, so that's pretty cool uh, today to have that. So, uh, but what you saw in that is you were, you celebrated your family unit, right? Moms and dads and kids, um, you celebrated the fact that God's given you this gift of, of a child, and even in the imperfections that we all have and even that are in our children, you love them and you're pleased with them. And you're there to support and encourage them all throughout their life in whatever way you can. You move forward through life together. Through all of the ups and downs or the hills and valleys as the song says. You know, there's hills and valleys along the way. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of strength and power in that family unit. That, I just thought of this now, that rock of support, right? Yeah. And so, chapter 3. However, I'm going to read to you the account from from uh, Matthew, after I read this uh, theme verse one more time, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too, and as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love with you, I am well pleased. Matthew, Matthew puts it this way. He says, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. 
And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With Him I am well pleased. You see, in this moment, we have, we have that unity of family in the Godhead right here. That, that mystery we call the Holy Trinity, of that mystery of faith that, that declares that our God is three persons, yet one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No matter how you attempt to explain it or try to understand it, you can't. It's an article of faith. And yet all three persons are present here as Jesus comes from the Jordan River that day and begins His ministry, His walk essentially, to the cross and the empty tomb and the ascension. He has the full support and encouragement of His Father and the Holy Spirit. And you see, in that baptism, Jesus identifies with you and with me. Where Jesus connects Himself to us here at the water. When God's powerful word of promise is joined with that water three times, baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, you are made a part of God's family forever. God welcomes you as one who is a dearly loved child of His And connects you to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. God forgives you of all your sins, past, present, and future. God gives to you the gift of eternal life. That God put His seal of approval on with the resurrection of His one and only Son. God promises to go with you through life to walk by your side, to continue to lead you. Remember I talked a few weeks ago about, I like to have the picture of of God or or Jesus right a half step ahead of me holding my hand even though I'm trying to wiggle it away. He's still grabbing onto it and walking with me. Come on. Or even when I wiggle away and I go my own way and I, I fall off. Remember I almost fell off a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Nick would catch me. Jesus runs over and picks me up and dusts me off and says, come on. Heals me when I need to be healed from the sin or the sickness or whatever it is and goes with me. God makes all those promises and so much more to you and me at baptism identifies with who we are. You see, we have a a, a God who understands what it is to walk through this life. This life that's corrupted by sin. No other religion on the face of the earth has that. A God who loved you so much that He became one of you, one of us, to bring us what we needed most. Baptism is God's connecting point to you and me for all time. <laughs> he puts his mark on you. That's why in baptism, one of the first things we do is we say, receive the sign of the cross upon your forehead and upon your heart that marks you always as one redeemed by Christ the crucified and the risen one. Awesome stuff. I like Luther's quote about baptism. He says this, He says, there is no greater comfort than baptism. Because we need what it offers. Some Bible passages for you to mark down or remember about our need for baptism. Uh, We start with Psalm 51. For I was born a sinner, yes, from the very moment my mother conceived me. And Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. 
But yet God calls out to us in His gracious promise of life and, and salvation. In Titus chapter 3, He says, 